All right, welcome back. We are on the very final lap of our conversation on the show today, and we're looking at um, a very important conversation around uh, the Naira. We have seen the Naira loses value, uh, uh, most recently, uh, you know, in an exponential, exponential trajectory, I must say. Uh, the last count, we saw the Naira being traded at the parallel market at 710. 10 Naira. It, it has been a depreciation one too many in, in recent times. We're trying to make some sense out, out of this. Uh, we've seen analysts speak, analysts have given their position on the matter. But let's listen to Kevin Emmanuel, a development economist, and let him just throw some more light into the conversation as to why the Naira seem to be on a downward trajectory. We're losing the value every day. It's losing its value every day with the other foreign currencies appreciating the Naira is, um, you know, diving, diving deep. Uh, Kelvin, it's so good to have you again. So good to have you uh, come on the program again. Let's, let's discuss this Naira uh, conversation in, in very layman terms, in very layman terms. Kevin, t tell me exactly what the issues are. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me. So the challenges with the Naira are both fiscal as much as they are structural. And first of all, I must say to you very, in very, very plain terms that central banks are very conservative institutions. And the role of the governor of a central bank and his deputies are also very conservative roles. There are codes of conduct specified that guides the behavior of the leadership of a central bank. The last utterance the governor of the central bank made about um, prosecuting and jailing people who buy the US dollar from their bank accounts does not give any succor to the perception around the security of holding your money in Naira. You can imagine a central bank governor openly saying that they are going to prosecute or ban the accounts of individuals and companies who use their Naira accounts with deposit money banks in Nigeria to purchase USD. I mean, what is the option? So for, for, for example, if I want to import equipment for my business or stock from China and I have $100,000 worth of transactions and I apply for a Form M and I'm on the queue for three or four months and I can't get it, what do I do? I go to the black market. We, we, we have to understand that it's, it's time for us to accept that there is nothing like the official rates. An official market that cannot supply the demands for liquidity that the market needs from multinational companies who need FX to repatriate profits, from multinational companies or companies in Nigeria who need FX to buy raw materials to manufacture, from PM families who need FX to pay school fees and have delayed medical bills to businesses who need FX to import stock. We have to understand and accept the reality that there is nothing like an official market. What we have is the parallel market. And that's the situation today. And then you have other issues like the debt servicing to government revenue currently at 119%, which is really like it happened faster than the World Bank and the IMF predicted because as at the time the IMF predicted it, it, it was at somewhere around 85.5%. The debt servicing to government revenues was at 5.5%. So it surpassed 100%. And right now, as we speak, the government needs to borrow to fund its operational expenses, which is a tragedy. That doesn't help the situation with the Naira. Okay, so... Um, so first these, off, are, these are the issues that... All right, first off... Uh, thank you for joining us. Good morning to you. Um, you did mention the CBN governor's um, statements uh, a couple of days ago, but I think he was particularly referring to those looking to buy the dollar uh, for electioneering purposes. The central uh, bank governor is not supposed to make a statement like that. Okay. Well, nonetheless, he because was the referring central bank governor specifically. Is not supposed to make an unguarded statement like that. He was referring specifically for those buying the dollar for electioneering processes. Uh, away from that. 
Um, let's look at the main issues now. It's an 11% drop within seven days. What, why is this happening so there rapidly? There is panic. Why is it happening so rapidly? It's panic. It's panic. People are afraid. It's panic. It's panic buying. In CBN, he noticed very well that from the day he made that statement, the drop accelerated. It's panic buying. There is, no, there is no explanation for it. It's speculation. It's panic buying. And right now, there are two things the, gov the, the government can do. Two things. In my opinion, there is a good option, which is the option that every sensible Nigerian has clamored for, for forever now. And there is the worst option, which is like the option that they might be compelled to take to bring super to the exchange rate market in Nigeria temporarily. The good option is to remove the peg on the exchange rates and allow the market to float, like Egypt did in November of 2016 to the Egyptian pounds. That's the good option. The worst option is to bring back the association of bureau exchange owners of Nigeria and start selling to them at the biweekly at the markets again, like they used to do, to create liquidity and crash the rates to somewhere around 500 or 520 which is still manageable. That's the worst option that they might be compelled to do, even if it's not an option, a support. But to provide temporary reprieve to people, because if the government does not do anything about the exchange rates, subsidy payments will accelerate, and inflation will continue high. Inflation continues high. The government needs to raise the NPR to align the curve, and the, the, the pressure on the economy will continue. That's what will happen. Let's, let's, look at it, let's look at it from this perspective. You and I know that the CBN does not print, don't print foreign exchange. Uh, they don't print dollars, or neither do they print the euro. Uh, we only get dollars, we only get dollars from our, our, crude, our crude revenue. Uh, sadly so, we have not improved on our, our, our um, export earnings, which is pretty, pretty sad. Uh, so we all depend on, on revenue from crude, which is in dollars. And now uh, you can also see where the crude uh, sales uh, stands as, as, as we speak. Uh, we are selling less than 1. Uh, 1.3 million barrels every day. And that tells you that, of course, there is a dearth of, um, of dollars into, this, into the system. Let's look at what we as a people are meant to do. Yes, you did mention the fiscal uh, lack of responsibility from the fiscal side. Let's look at us as a people. You talked about um, a demand for importation. Just maybe if we can reduce our crave uh, for importations. Just maybe we could reduce, uh, uh, you know, the, the attention for foreign exchange. Just maybe the Naira could appreciate COVID. Look, um, so, so very, very important um, point, but I, I, need, I need you to understand that these are structural issues that takes time. You're basically referring to backward integration. And, you know, Manufacturers Association of Nigeria, I think, released a report that talked about the fact that 70% um, of the raw materials used for processing across 70, 44 sectors in Nigeria actually are suffering uh, because they lack from M um, to import those raw materials to process. And I've constantly uh, mentioned that we have a lack of enterprise manufacturing businesses in Nigeria that the consumer manufacturing companies need to survive. And the reason why food inflation has gone up is because the enterprise manufacturers that are a backbone to supply the semi-processed inputs needed for consumer manufacturing are not present in Nigeria. And the companies that have to import these raw materials are subject to the vagaries of the drop in the exchange rate. OK? So reducing the level of demand for import will come from structural adjustment that can only be achieved through backward integration. So for example, Last year, Nigeria spent 425 billion naira importing 1.6 million metric tons of raw unfortified sugar from Brazil, India, China, and a few other countries, right? The Nigerian Sugar Master Plan 
talks about the backward integration of sugar in four phases, phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four, up to one million metric tons. But it will interest you to note that in the intervening period between 1990 and 2019, which is a period of 29 years, the curve shows that the production output of sugar in Nigeria actually dropped from 41,500 metric tons to 39,600 metric tons, which is about 1,900 metric ton drop in 29 years. Production output, net negative. While the demand for sugar went up from 600,000 to 1.6 million metric tons. So what are we saying? If you want to reduce the demand for imports, backward integration. But sugar is a typical example of what we've not achieved and how we've not implemented the beautiful plans that we have for backward integration in Nigeria, except for rice that the government has made progress with, which we still have a shortage of about 3 million metric tons a year, currently as we speak. The other near-term solution to the government actually balancing its budget is removing the excess crude account. If you remove the excess crude account, there is no cap on the government revenues. There is no benchmark price on crude oil, which is currently somewhere around 65 or $68 per barrel, if I'm not mistaken. If you remove the ECA, the government is going to be earning more revenues from selling crude oil, and you're going to see that ratio of debt savings to government revenue come back below 100% again. Why does the government remove, refuse to remove subsidy? Even, I'm sorry, um, the ECA, even if the excess crude accounts that were set up by President Lushio of Passenger in 2004 is an illegal account that contravenes Section 162.1 of the um, um, laws of the Federal Republic of Nigeria that says all revenue should be paid to a special account designated as the Federation account. Why are the members of the Nigerian Governors Forum that make up the National Economic Council refusing to remove the ECA and allow the government to collapse the ECA revenues into the Federation account in contravention to the Constitution of Nigeria? Why? Okay, so Kelvin, you know, that's an issue that you have brought up now, excess crude accounts, which has actually dropped tremendously um, within the past couple of years. Um, we do know that it was in the billions when Buhari, uh, when uh, Obasanjo was in government, and now we are into mere, mere millions uh, as it is today. Uh, let, let's look at the solutions to the problem. One of that you mentioned is excess crude account. Uh, some are also postulating probably Nigeria replicating what Russia is doing at the moment. Russia is stopping uh, the purchase of its crude by in dollars. And so anyone that wants to buy Russian crude has to buy in the Russian ruben. And that is an issue that many Nigerians are, are, are thinking might be a solution to solving this challenge. Possibly we should begin to sell our crude in Naira. Is that possible? The question you should ask yourself is, um, while that is an argument that should not be discarded, the question you should ask yourself is, how, what is Nigeria's production output on a daily basis? And in the production sharing agreements, for, uh, for in the production sharing agreement between joint venture partnership between the NMPC and its JV partners, how much of that 1.4, 1.5 million barrels of crude oil actually comes to the NMPC? That's the question you should ask yourself. That's the first question. Now, the second question you should ask yourself is, when you calculate the difference between the cost of production per barrel of crude oil, which is somewhere between $25 and $28 per barrel, and $65, which is somewhere around $40 per barrel that the government is earning in profits currently from crude oil, how much is the government making, considering that the ECA places a cap? That's the question you should ask yourself. When you compare the output of Russia to Nigeria, you see that um, the difference between Russia's output and Nigeria it's about 10 million barrels a day, which doesn't give Nigeria a lot of leverage. Number two, number two, Nigeria is part of OPEC, it's not part of OPEC. Nigeria is subject to the policies and laws that governs the conduct of oil producing members. Russia is a non-OPEC country, number two. Number three, Nigeria does not have the leverage that Russia has as a country. Sure. To go to um, um, the US, okay, I'll give you a typical example. Nigeria, Nigeria and China has 
a um, highest trade relationship in terms of the ratio of the imports Nigeria brings from China compared to any other country in the world. Nigeria has about $65 billion of imports on a yearly basis. The share of imports from China of that $65 billion is nearly $13 billion. Right. But it's interesting to note that the reserves that the central bank has in foreign banknotes and deposits with the People's Bank of China yeah. is only about 2.8% of Remember. the total reserves that Nigeria has outside of Nigeria. That, why, 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 why would the CBN hold 98.4% of its foreign reserves with the U.S. government when the Nigeria has only $5.4 billion worth of, of, of trade, trade relationship trade. with the U.S.? Why? Okay, so... So, for example, yes. you can't even facilitate... You can't even facilitate the Naira Yuan swap that the government implemented in 2018 because the central bank does not have deposits to create liquidity mm. to provide the yuan as a currency for people to trade directly with the yuan without going True. through the US dollars as a swap currency. True. Okay, so so Kevin, in, in these view, are questions that you have to bring up with the US government. In in, in view of this, you, you have just you have just you just created. I mean, you, you just explained that we don't even have that capacity. Uh, uh, to make such demands. We don't have that capacity uh, to make such demands. Uh, but I'm seeing this more from uh, uh, a lack of fiscal responsibility here. Uh, the fiscal authorities are not doing what they are meant to do. It, it is not basically all about the monetary policies here. Uh, that is also very key. But look at it from the fiscal perspective. Uh, we don't have light. We don't have power. Uh, then we cannot manufacture. We don't have power, and that is a key component to why we have um, low productivity uh, going forward. Just maybe if we begin to fix all these uh, infrastructures, if we begin to fix all these infrastructures, then the whole concept of um, diversification and an increased manufacturing, manufacture, manufacturing it can just be a, a way to go uh, for this economy. I will talk about power from two angles. I'll talk about power from the angle of the situation you currently have with the generating companies, the Genkos, the transmission company of Nigeria, the Discos, and the uh, uh, MBET subsidy and grants that the federal government provides to MBET to you know, guarantee offtake, a minimum um, um, offtake um, capacity from the Genkos that the government recently stopped you know, and the government should completely unwind. And then I'll talk about power from a stopgap measure I think the government can implement to alleviate or ameliorate the problems that industries and companies are, are facing in their clusters. Now, what are the issues? Number one, as we speak currently, the discos owe the Genkos billions, number one. Number two, the discos are unable to take all the load that the Genkos generates, number two problem. Number three, transmission company of Nigeria that is run by the federal government is unable to provide the transmission lines necessary to transmit adequate capacity from the Genkos to the Discos. Number three problem. Number four problem. There is an issue with prepaid and postpaid, migrating customers from postpaid to prepaid, which leads to a lot of revenue losses for the Discos. Number four problem. So. They passed, the National Assembly passed a bill, they uh, passed a law that says that, uh, that to encourage the use of um, prepaid meters. And the central bank has been providing uh, facilities to enable um, the purchase of meters. And I heard that the central bank actually obtained um, an ex parte order from the court like a week ago to sanction companies that have not followed the guidelines that it gave for those facilities to drive the implementation of prepaid meters in Nigeria. Okay? My recommendation to the government, privatize a part of the transmission company of Nigeria. First recommendation. Number two, remove your hands from embeds. Remove embeds from the equation and allow the private sector to run the power sector like the telecommunication companies licenses, GSM licenses in 2001 to run the telco um, industry in Nigeria. Allow the markets to price. Provide constant power. 
Providing constant power at an ex more expensive rate is cheaper than citizens of Nigeria buying diesel at 900 naira per liter or at 300 naira from the black market to power their generators. So, Stop so, gap measure, I think the government can implement. Stop gap measure, I think the government can implement. Okay, so... Um, removing the power from exclusive to, to concurrent list, the government can actually have state governors implement independent power plants and mini grids and provide power for industrial clusters as a stopgap measure. Okay, so um, to, to, to put things in perspective, uh, the inflation that we're seeing across Nigeria is not unique to Nigeria alone. Many countries are also suffering a similar fate to the, to the dollar. Um, I was watching um, a breakdown of analysis um, the Indian currency is also suffering to the dollar. Uh, we know that other currencies which transact in dollars for foreign exchange are also losing their value to the dollar. Uh, so what exactly is that, is causing that issue then? Since it's, not, it's no longer a Nigerian issue alone. It's not peculiar to Nigeria alone. Well, to be fair to the Nigerian government, I would say when you come to the areas where Russia and Ukraine control the supply chain and where countries in the Baltics that were um, suppliers of raw materials for production in Nigeria, um, I would say in the areas of um, Muret or Potash, um, specific chemicals that are used for different manufacturing in Nigeria, in the areas of grains like um, wheat, to be fair to the government, in the areas of the price of diesel, Russia and Ukraine situation and the close of that um, Bosporus and Denali Straits in Turkey has an effect on the prices of diesel, on the price of fertilizer, on the prices of wheat, and so on and so forth. But let us not forget that before the situation started between Russia and Ukraine, we had a lot of the structural issues that we currently have today. Let us not forget. The price of sugar, the price of milk, was as bad seven, eight months ago as it is today. Milk mostly comes from Western Europe. Dairy milk comes from Western Europe. Yeah? Sugar comes from South America, China, and India. So the Nigerian government cannot say that all of the issues that we have currently is because of the situation between Russia and Ukraine. You can't say that. All right, so so Kevin, Kevin, you you completely agree with me uh, when I talked about the fact that uh, the lack of um, fiscal responsibility is also very key uh, to why the Naira is facing what it is facing today. I'm, I'm happy you were trying to explain uh, the concerns around the power sector and how we can deal with that. I've, I'm sure you have, you've identified that that is also very key uh, if this economy uh, must, must survive. Uh, we must deal with the power concerns um, uh, going forward. But I'm also very concerned um, about us as a people. Uh, we don't seem to show enough response. We saw the central bank ban uh, some items from um, direct FX uh, a couple of years back, still, it is still a standing law. But that has not deterred Nigerians from bringing in those um, items, even though most of them we could even produce in, in, in ours, I mean, domestically. So the, the crave for importation, uh, if we can curb that, wouldn't that also be a way of reducing the, the, the impact on the dollar? Uh, the crave for, for dollars in the market. Wouldn't that, wouldn't that be? I think this is where the Ministry of Industry, Trade and Investment um, and all the um, agencies that are under it comes into play in driving um, backward integration aggressively. The Ministry of um, Trade and Investment, Water Resources, um, and Rural and Agricultural Development, um, the Central Bank of Nigeria, NISAL, this is where they have their work cut out for them in driving backward integration because the key to reducing the amount of imports that you have, considering that we have the current account um, negative and uh, balance of trade deficit across most countries that we deal with, you know, 
it's where backward integration comes in for several sectors of the economy. I'll give you an example, and this is an example that the governor of the central bank has mentioned in one of his speeches. For industrial starch that is used in confectionery food and the pharmaceuticals, for example, Nigeria currently spends about $600 million a year importing industrial starch into this country. Currently, as we speak, currently, as we speak, the, the ethanol, biograde ethanol we use in Nigeria, about 85% um, of the ethanol we use in Nigeria is imported from other parts of the world. You can produce ethanol from sugar, you can produce ethanol from potato, you can produce ethanol from cassava, you can produce ethanol from corn. Why are we not producing the ethanol that we need for the economy? You can imagine the amount of money Nigerians spend in importing biograde ethanol into the country. And it goes for several, it goes for so many other sectors, more than 40 sectors of the economy. So the Ministry of Industry, Trade and Investment needs to work with its allies, the fiscal authorities, to ensure that it drives the backward integration agenda of the government that was first, first designed by President Olusegun Obasanjo in the 2000s. And then was, you know, it came back on stream when um, President Buhari came in 2015. He's tried it rice. They are trying with one or two other areas, but it's not fast enough. I gave an example of sugar. Sugar that is like a commodity that we consume every day and is used for production and manufacturing. Nigeria spent 425 billion naira last year importing sugar. Why can't we produce the sugar we consume? We need to wrap up now. Um, yes, you, you have mentioned that, you know, um, we need to take more fiscal responsibility for the products that we consume. But many would also argue again that, you know, the U.S. dollar, which we are trading with, uh, U.S. is a majorly important country, but yet, of course, that is also causing inflation in their states at the moment as well. Um, finally, solutions now. Um, what would be the solution with, between the Central Bank of Nigeria and the banks across the country to help curb the situation and manage it? You've mentioned that um, there are positions that should be taken with, um, you know, uh, um, I don't want to call them the local um, brutal change uh, operators across the country. But what can the banks, what roles can the banks play with the CBN to solve this issue as we wrap up? Well, the, the, the CBN, the roles that the commercial banks can play with the CBN is limited because if it's going to continue the current FX regime it has, it's limited in the way it, it has to, it, it, you see, the, the, the major problem for the banks is determining, having to separate between who is buying FX for speculative purpose and who is buying FX to trade. That's the major problem it has. Even with, um, with um, um, PTA and BTA, there were cases, a lot of cases of people who falsified travel documents just to get PTA at official rates. So that's the major headache it has. In my opinion, in my opinion, if I'm going to be very frank with you, I think it's high time the Nigerian government takes the bull by the horn and bites the peel by removing the peg and stopping this regime of having an official government rate that it subsidizes, that doesn't have liquidity to back, and allow the markets to determine the exchange rates. That's my opinion on this issue. That's the best solution. For, for, for a temporary measure, which might create some kind of um, succor to Nigerians and reduce their pain, which I don't back, which I don't support, which I think would be a terrible idea. Yes. But in the interest of Nigerians, the CBM might want to consider bringing back the BDCs back hmm. as a temporary measure. Oh. All right, uh, uh, Kevin Emmanuel, always a pleasure having you talk to us on financial issues on the station. Always, always a pleasure. Thank you, thank you, always, for coming on the program. Thank you for having me. All right, and that is our show today. It's been fantastic speaking with all our guests on the show, Madi, Madi Sheo, uh, Ayobe, and finally, uh, Kevin Emmanuel. Fantastic conversation. But then, this is where we say thank you for staying with us on the show all through the week. It's been fantastic having you uh, with us all through the week. It's a weekend. Uh, stay safe and uh, have some fun, but stay safe as well. I'm David Obabadike. And ensure you go about getting your PVCs as the deadline continues to loom. I am Wilson Omoni, and ensure to be a part of the 2023 elections.
Bye for now. Bye for now.